All right, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to the Daily Space Weather. We've got a lot of interesting stuff, including compelling imagery of the sun, talk about the butterfly diagram and latitudes of sunspots, and lots more. The most spectacular imagery you'll see of the closest star on the Internet right here on this channel. Congratulations on realizing we exist. Here's the colorized magnetogram from the SDO Browse Data, the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And check out the latitudes of these sunspots, folks. We've got two completely different latitudes going on here. We've got this attitude, latitude here. And then we've got sunspots down at this lower latitude. And that tells us something about the progression of the solar cycles. We'll get to it. First, let's talk about how we've relaxed the coronal mass ejection warning to a watch as we're only expecting to see a coronal mass ejection on the far side of the sun, not on the Earth side. For your new viewers, we forecast coronal mass ejections on this side of the sun, not on this side, only on this side, because Earth would be off in this vicinity from Lagrange point five, the location of stereo A. One of the best tools that we have to view trajectories of coronal mass ejection. So we've relaxed the coronal mass ejection warning. There still is a solar flare warning for the Earth side of the sun. And we're seeing a likelihood of a coronal mass ejection on the far side of the sun. Let's take a look at what's going on in the northern hemisphere. So we've uh, put the Earth scale here right next to this large sunspot moving into a setting mode in the northwest. You can see it's a little bigger than planet Earth. And this is a composite view, 1600 and 1700 angstroms from the SDO. Here's a different set of wavelengths around the same latitude. There is a large plasma filament up here. And we're not expecting this to be ejected by the time tomorrow's video comes out. Otherwise, we would retain our coronal mass ejection warning. So this is 304 and 171 angstroms ionized helium and, I and iron. Great view of the northern hemisphere here. How about the southern hemisphere? Where most of the activity is going on. And you can see these at least five sunspots here located at... Pretty high latitudes, high latitudes meaning closer to the solar polar region, low latitudes would be closer to the equator, and yeah, the likelihood of major flares from especially these two sunspots here, quite high, still significant from this one and this one as well, as there are fairly complex magnetic fields associated with these active regions. Legit sunspots. So here, here they are in this same wavelength. We looked at the northern hemisphere in 1600 and 1700 angstroms. Just spectacular imagery. And those sunspots have remained largely stable. There was a point where we reached all the way to uh, seven sunspot groups briefly. I, th I don't think that one got named. This one down here is 2870. So, yeah, major uptick in solar activity here. Highest levels we've seen during the entire solar cycle 25. So the 10.7 centimeter radio flux has stalled out at 100 solar flux units. And you can see the sunspot number has massively surpassed the radio flux here, making it all the way up to like 125 sunspots there. That red line, that's a sunspot number. This is a one-year chart from Solon.info. The black line is the radio flux. So major activity here, the most we've seen in cycle 25. And here's a Space Weather Enthusiast dashboard, and I've got some oddities showing up on this as well. It's as if uh, NOAA is forecasting an Earth-facing coronal mass ejection here. So I've never seen that before. And I, I don't know what they're talking about. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me, especially considering the last uh, the last forecasts for coronal mass ejection trajectories have been so off. I've never seen them try to forecast a CME before. And uh, you can see here in this Enlil spiral, they're forecasting a CME to start to propagate on the 12th for some reason on the Earth side of the sun. So I, I don't know what that's all about. Uh, I assume this will probably change. I'm taking an educated guess, thinking this will probably change. <clears throat> it does not affect our coronal mass ejection watch or our solar flare warning. Let's take a brief look at seismicity. Here's a bar graph of the earthquakes over the past year. That's courtesy volcanodiscovery.com. There's last year. And here is the last 90 days. So low levels of activity at the moment. We did see quite a bit of earthquakes here in southern Alaska. Shout out to Brett. Drop us a line if you felt any of those. Looks like you probably did. 
No major quakes over the past 24 hours. Let's just quickly scroll up the list here and move on as there's plenty of stuff to talk about. A deep quake at Guam, a 4.5 magnitude, over 125 kilometers depth. One of those Alaskan quakes, the one in the Aleutian Islands, was a 5.1. There's been a deep quake at Fiji, as well as at Afghanistan, those both in the mid-4 range. Extremely deep quake near Fiji as well, a 4.7 at over 615 kilometers depth. Estimated depth 618.5 kilometers there. Also in the West Chile rise, a little uptick here west of South America in the southern Pacific. Again, no major quakes over the past 24. Let's check volcanoes. Karimsky still erupting on the Kamchatka Peninsula, though volcanic ash not identifiable in satellite, Im satellite imagery. It could be it could be cloudy. Subano Sejima, flight level 080. It's an 8,000-foot ash plume. Samisa Pochnoi, no report provided on volcanic ash from the Aleutian Islands. Popocatapetl volcanic ash not observed either, perhaps a cloudy day in Mexico as well. Fuego exploding, producing a 15,000-foot ash plume over Guatemala. Nevado del Ruiz, volcanic ash not observed over Colombia. Don't assume that one's not erupting. Revenador exploding, 15,000-foot ash plume over Ecuador. Sabancaya exploding, 23,000-foot ash plume over Peru. Do not pull vault to Caldera. Do visit our links. You can find links below the video in the description. You can also find links on our homepage, smashomash.com. Smashomash.org will relocate you. So please don't pull Volta Caldera. Please do pick up some products if you are in the market. Smashomash.com has links to all of that, our Smash merch. And thanks to the Smash team, these videos are brought to you in part by the Smash team. Smashomash.com slash Smash team. And we see some pretty wild spikes here in the GOES magnetometer over the past 24 as well as an arc jet moment. That is when the goes, in this case, the goes 16, which is the red line, uh, no, the blue line here, the goes 17, turns on its thrusters and creates some plasma, which could affect its magnetic field measurements. That's why it lists those as arc jet moments. The M's and N's mean midnight and noon local time for the satellites. Earth is in a North Pole current sheet, and we expect it to remain here for the foreseeable future. North Pole current sheet shown here in green. And don't be surprised to see additional sunspots showing up in the southern hemisphere. We'll also show you the line of sight view of this same data set. It also shows you the solar magnetogram. It's a three-dimensional drawing, a three-dimensional data interpretation of the potential field surface source lines. North Pole in green, South Pole in red. And next line of sight, coronal hole plot. We do see a trans-equatorial coronal hole here. It's North Pole oriented. And behind it is a South Pole one. So finally seeing some cycle progression and some indications it will not be a weak solar cycle. Yes, I said it. So here is uh, the 193 and 211 angstroms composite imagery. And those coronal holes not looking particularly well defined. Again, there is a large filament all the way down in this area here, from about here way up to here near the pole. We're not expecting that to eject in the next 24 hours. We are expecting a coronal mass ejection on the far side of the sun, not the Earth side. Anyway, those coronal holes not showing up too well, but this area down here, that's a North Pole-oriented coronal hole stretching well below the equator. We'll see how that progresses over the next couple of days. Very high likelihood of major solar flares as sunspot 2868 and 2866 move toward the limb. The likelihood of them producing major flares is much higher. So a solar flare warning is in effect. Solar flare warning, coronal mass ejection watch. Don't get them confused. Solar flares are X-ray photons. Coronal mass ejections are mostly hydrogen nuclei or protons. Continuing on, no major flares over the past few days. And we've been seeing flares coinciding with our videos. The first time in about three videos here that we haven't seen a flare associated with our video production. Figure that one out. Perhaps leave the sun a comment in our comments section. 
Not sure if the sun reads YouTube comments or not. So here's the ghost proton flux over the past three days. No spikes in that. No surprise. No relativistic particles forecasted by the channel. And none arriving. Next, the real-time solar wind. Fairly unremarkable here over the past 24. We've seen a downtick in the density over the past several hours. Nothing to write home about here. Some recent shifts happening, happening in the solar wind data, though. Current conditions are 11.37 protons per cubic centimeter for the density for the speed 347 kilometers per second, basically background levels there. Next, the magnetohydrodynamic pressure as modeled by the Space Weather Modeling Framework over the past four hours. It's the geospace. It's giving you an indication where Earth's geomagnetic poles are located. The geomagnetic poles are the magnetic moment the sun's incoming protons see in space. Not to be confused with a magnetic pole, the location of Earth's magnetism on the surface of the planet. Anyway, there's four hours of data, pretty consistent magnetohydrodynamic pressure here over the past four. Let's look at ground magnetic perturbation since we just explained the difference between the geomagnetic pole and the magnetic pole. Shout out to Eugene Bagashov. Here's four hours of data of ground magnetic perturbations. Since there is a polar excursion going on, we show it daily. And nothing too extraordinary happening there either. KP index at two. If you're wondering what that is, that's a measurement of global geomagnetism. And when we see a solar storm, we see a KP of five only having seen geomagnetic unrest in the past few days. Here's a diagram of the solar system. We'll advance it one week. There's where things will be in a week. Here's a star chart from in-the-sky.org. I face mine to the south. We've drawn on the ecliptic, which is the yellow line, and the galactic plane, which is the blue line. Continuing on to our brief cosmology segment. Once again, integrated to the Daily Space Weather video, we do have playlists with over 200 videos with cosmology segments. Perhaps check those out. And we're going to pick a random number. Not four. How about 15? Today's random number coincides with an object known as CXOM31004211371. Anyway, something in the Andromeda galaxy, I would think. And it is uh, some sort of an X-ray source. I honestly have no idea what that is. A, a source of X-rays. Let's see if we can find out on DuckDuckGo what it is. Discovered only in 2011 by the Chandra. Likely to be a low-mass X-ray binary with a black hole primary. All right. That massive radio source does emit X-rays. We can definitely say that. There are the last 16 years. How could it have been discovered in 2011 if Neil Gorel's Swift Bat X-ray Observatory has been tracking it since 2004? Anyway, there's a 30-day chart. It's a consistent X-ray source. If you want to read more about that, just look up the catchy name, CXOM31004211.37 plus 41042551. Continuing on to the astronomy picture of the day at apod.nasa.gov. It's apod.nasa.gov. Looks like a comet and a bright star, a bright blue star. And it's Comet... Churyumov Gerasmenko. I'm not good with the Russian language, particularly, folks. Showing up there in the constellation Taurus. Pretty good imagery there of a comet and some bright stars at apod.nasa.gov. Did you hear about uh, cosmonauts waking up to the smell of smoke and burning plastic in the... Zvezda module of the International Space Station. By the way, they're planning on abandoning this, abandoning this in about 2025. So some issues there. They scrubbed things out with their air cleaning system, and everything seemed fine. They went back to sleep after the atmospheric warnings went away on the space station. That's today's cosmology segment. Again, check our playlists for hundreds more. And all kinds of videos not associated with space. Checking satellite charging hazards, and we see some minor surface charging here over places like Mexico moving into the Central Pacific. Nothing major. Here's the one-year chart from Solon.info. 
actually pretty low levels of electron flux here, and some chaotic electron bands. We'll show you in a minute. First, the three-day chart as measured by the GOES-16 and 17s. They're using radiography from a geosynchronous orbit to measure the electron flux at the F ionosphere layer. So while they're at tens of thousands of miles of altitude, they're measuring the electrons at about 300 kilometers of altitude, where the F layer is located. We'll show you ionograms momentarily. First, the electron forecast model, and NOAA expecting a small uptick in the electron flux. No arguments here. The green boxes are the forecast. The yellow diamonds are the observation. Here's a diagram of Earth's Van Allen belts. And here's the total electron content. So now you're looking at the total air column all the way from a GPS satellite down to your handset. And we're seeing some quite high levels of electron flux here over places like Southeast Asia, the Northern Indian Ocean, And those are the areas likely to have very high GPS errors. GPS errors most common around the equator at noon. We've got some chaos going on here, some slightly disorganized electron belts. Next, looking at the uh, ionosphere layer located at about 300 kilometers of altitude. As we said, this diagram shows thermospheric temperatures, electromagnetic radiation penetration into atmospheric layers, as well as molecular concentrations in the thermosphere. Here's your ionogram looking at megahertz vibrational frequency in millions of vibrations per second. Each blob coincides with one different one megahertz difference. Unfortunately, the resolution in this is only one megahertz, so not showing us super detailed information here, but giving us global trends in what's going on with the magnetosphere and so on. Here's the latest image from 10 o'clock Universal Time. Nothing too, no, nothing too abnormal there. Here's your anomaly map. This is departure from the 30-day median. And we can expect to see more anomalies as we approach the equinox. The equinox is much more geomagnetically effective than solstice times. Here's the latest image in the, in the anomaly gram. Again, it's showing you anomaly. Departure from the 30-day median in megahertz. Mostly high-frequency anomalies at the moment. There's the ionogram. And there's the anomaly map. That's from 10 o'clock Universal Time. Meteorology at the Smash News Network. We've got segments. There's a playlist for it. YouTube.com slash smash and slash playlist. Here come our bonus segments. It's the El Taide, Spain, ground-based solar observatory, part of the National Sunspot Observatory. So some very new imagery here, only three minutes and three seconds old from when we recorded the video. And we've got six sunspot groups at the moment. Solar flare warning in effect. Coronal mass ejection watch. Coronal mass ejection warning on the far side, just not the Earth side. And let's talk about the butterfly diagram. So one of the things that we see, folks, is we see oddities in the butterfly diagram. What is the butterfly diagram? The butterfly diagram is the fact that at the beginning of solar cycles, we see sunspots at a very high latitude, closer to the poles. At the end of sunspot cycles, we see only sunspots near the equator, until we see spots from the next cycle popping up. So beginning of cycle, you see high latitude sunspots. End of cycle, you see sunspots much closer to the equator. And what do we see now? Well, what we see now is a series of high latitude sunspots, especially in the southern hemisphere. We've got two distinct rows. And if you want to read more about the butterfly diagram, just look it up. It's very, very famous, uh, discovered by Maunder, Walter Maunder. And just a brief quote from this article here. Although the equator... Solar activity as represented by the sunspots appears at mid-latitudes at the start of each cycle. The bands of activity spread in each hemisphere and then drift toward the equator as the cycle progresses. Although the equator itself tends to be avoided, the spread of activity reaches the equator at about the time of solar maximum. The cycles overlap at minimum with old cycle spots appearing near the equator while new cycle spots emerge in the mid-latitudes. Large amplitude cycles tend to have activity starting at higher latitudes with the activity spreading to higher latitudes as well. And what do we see now? Two distinct strata in the southern hemisphere. <clears throat> in other words, you've got mid-latitude spots and then you've got high-latitude spots at least a few of them. 
So that is an indication that you may not be seeing a solar cycle as weak as some people that don't understand the physics would like you to believe. Now, we prefer to not grift on YouTube as there are a lot of grifters trying to sell you things and convince you of things that aren't true in order to do so. So I'll just leave it at that. And uh, yeah, so there's what's going on. And uh, these have remained stable. Again, as they approach the limb, especially these two, as they approach the limb, the likelihood of producing large flares is higher. This is still a major beta class sunspot group as well, folks. And this one down here has decayed, decayed to plage. So we've got uh, five sunspot groups at the moment. One, two, three, four, five. Here are the magnetic fields. And here's some additional imagery here. This is a, a full disk view in 304 and 171 angstroms, ionized helium and iron. Here's just the helium, 304 angstroms. And expect to see a far side coronal mass ejection coming out soon. It may confuse some people as often far side coronal mass ejections are directed in such a manner that people think they're headed toward the Earth, <clears throat> especially when they're headed directly away from the Earth. It has to do with the views from the Lagrange Point 1 spacecraft SOHO and the coronagraphs aboard that, the Lasco C2 and C3. And we'll close things out in my favorite wavelength. It's 171 angstroms. Thanks again for tuning in to the Daily Space Weather. Please tell your friends and foes about the content. Tell your science noobs and science pros about the content. And may that solar wind be at your back.